I'm uh, Mark Chayette. I'm uh, probably the oddball talking to you this morning. Although when I first looked at your society and, and uh, got the invitation, like our pediatric surgical society is APSA. So we were like same letters, a little different uh, formation there. But actually, uh, Dr. Trumbull, I think Eric Trumbull spoke to you guys yesterday. He and I have been friends for uh, 29 years as of this week. Uh, we started uh, practicing here in Orlando on the same day. And he had contacted me about this organization and said that there were a few questions about pain management. And it's, uh, it's an area that I've spent a good time working with. And it's something that, that I hope I can share some information with you today that will be of value. So I put this up not to just show the CV of the odd combination of things I've done through my career, but really to show that picture of the lovely lady there, number two of five, or Alexis Chayette. So she is uh, at school now in uh, University of Pennsylvania in med school. And in the first six weeks of her school, one of the things she reached out to me to discuss was mindfulness. And that was very, very timely that you bring that up because as, as a practicing surgeon, I certainly had no idea what she was talking about. So I did, I did investigate with, with uh, Dr. Google and learned a bit about mindfulness and have to echo what Dr. Green had stated that it's, uh, I mean, I was very excited to see that it's something they're discussing in medical school at this point and sort of changing the, the dilemma of pure science and pure head in the books all the time. It was pretty, pretty neat to see that and it's something of great value. We're gonna talk a little bit about non-opioid analgesia, okay? We're gonna discuss why we should be talking about this and then talk about some ways to actually control our pain without opioids. Lots of pain inflicted in the United States by people uh, who stand at this podium. Uh, we do over 51,000 outpatient surgeries a year, about the same number of inpatient surgeries. And that's exactly what we're doing is, is we're creating trauma and need to, to manage that trauma. And this is how we've managed it for decades. A L- little bit of pain, start with some opioids. More pain, simple answer, up the dose. Another phone call from the ward, you got more of the same stuff, right? So everybody sort of had their favorite opioid they went to and maybe one they didn't like and then people come in with allergies to this or that and, and that's, that's how the ball has rolled for many years. Well, welcome to the USA opioid crisis. I mean, I don't think there's anyone in this room that hasn't read a story or seen a story on television dis- discussing the opioid crisis. And it's very clear where this has come from. It came from us. I mean, the opioids aren't manufactured in the United States and handed out. The prescription bottles that are used recreationally come from somewhere, and it's something that we really, really need to talk about and address. In 2012, I'm sorry, in 2001, uh, the, the Joint Commission actually came out with the idea that pain was the fifth vital sign, right? So we're not just going in and taking temperature. We're not just going in and checking heart rate, respiratory rate. We had to address the fifth vital sign. And if we didn't, I say we, I mean as, as caregivers, if we didn't address the fifth vital sign, we were, we were bad care, caregivers. In fact, so bad that we could be reported, so bad that we might not be reimbursed, and this became a really big deal. So there was this motivation that came from somewhat externally to treat pain, which you know, wasn't a bad nail, but it was definitely the wrong hammer. Pharma spent millions of dollars to convince the public that opioids were safe. They actually, they actually hired people, and, and, and I, I work with pharma, I'm not, I'm not screaming out that big pharma is a terrible thing, but they actually did have people out there that were giving lectures like I'm giving today and saying, opioids, oh no, we have scientific proof they're not addictive. And this is, this is just 2001, I mean, this wasn't in, in the 1850s, you know? And so sure enough, this, this went on for some time. In 1992, 50 billion MMEs, so that's the, that's the morphine milligrams equivalent, so if you look at morphine or dilaudid or the different drugs that, that are used, 50 mil, billion MMEs were uh, prescribed. By 2010, it was 250 billion. The DEA actually manages this. The DEA, the companies have to go to the DEA and say, we're gonna produce 18 truckloads of Percocet. Cool? And they say yes or no. 
Well, the total opioid market expanded so quickly without the DEA getting up and saying any, anything that it went from a $1 billion to an $8 billion market in just a matter of, of a, few, a few decades. So that's where the opioid crisis came from. So I want, if anybody's going to take a picture of any of my slides, this is the one to take a picture of. It's a great book. It's a quick read, American Pain. It's, uh, how many people are from Florida that are here today? Okay, so this is, it's a homegrown book. Okay, this is about the pill mills down in South Florida. Um, and if, if, if you have any Orlando connections, this has connections to Orlando. If you have any Kentucky connections, Georgia connections, Michigan connections, it's all in here. It's an amazing quick read. It's a true story. Uh, the, the, the people who opened up this, this pill mill uh, are, are in jail right now. Uh, they weren't physicians, actually. One was a general contractor and the other was his buddy. And they were bringing in $400,000 a week in cash. Like they, they actually would run out to Home Depot to buy garbage cans to put the money in. And it was all legal. Okay, so it's, it's an amazing book. W definitely, definitely worth your time and read. So how do we fix this problem that we've created? First step is, what's the first step in reducing the usage of opioids? I gotta get, is to get the clicker to work is to stop using opioids. So I actually lecture on the topic of reduction of opioids. In my surgery center, I've been able to work with the team, which are the anesthesiologists and the nurses, and convince them that we cannot just reduce opioids, that the best way is to go cold turkey. And so my anesthesiologists actually don't use opioids on any of my kids. So in the last six months, when we went full on and said this is what we're gonna do, uh, kids ages six months to 18 years, uh, general surgery, things like hernias, lumps and bumps, pyelonal cysts, you know, things that actually create some dis discomfort. We've given zero opioids, no rescues, no opioids at home, nothing in the OR. And we haven't denied treating pain. Uh, we've had a few families that would actually go to the point of saying, oh, you know, it seems pretty uncomfortable. This, this could be, over. so I always come, it's a face to face thing. Like we have to go out as the caregiver and say, absolutely, you know, we can, we can give them some, we've given them this and that, and we'll talk about some of the medications, but I, I could give them a narcotic, 100% of the family say, oh, oh, no, 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 I just wanna make sure everything else, but no narcotics. And you know, sometimes we'll give some Ativan, sometimes we'll treat the actual problem, which isn't pain, you know, it's anxiety, uh, and w we take care of that, but we've given no opioids in six months. So whenever someone asks, like, well, how do you do that? How do you not use opioids? Well, you stop using them, I mean, so our, no, no anesthesiologists in the room, I'm guessing. But so the anesthesiologists have, have a thing called a fentanyl intubation dose. Okay, so fentanyl is an opioid. It's a fast acting opioid, short acting opioid, uh, highly addictive. Uh, and we believe that even giving a dose of it potentiates the need for opioids later in your care. Okay, so what are they giving this painkiller for, for intubation? So if you ask them, they're like, well, you know, when you go to intubate somebody, their heart rate goes up. So they're drugs for heart rate, by the way, right? So that's one of the things that they have to change. Now, if I have a patient who has a critical heart condition and we might want to keep their blood pressure heart rate pretty tight, that, that is something that needs to be addressed. Usually we address that with drugs like Esmolol, which does control heart rate as opposed to fentanyl. But in the pediatric population, that's really not an issue. They can take a little extra heart rate. Might even be good to get the heart rate up a few times a week. I don't know if the intubation is the best way to go about that, but. So the Joint Commission recognized this in about 2012 and they put out a Sentinel alert saying, we're not treating pain very well. In fact, the things that we're using to treat pain are actually causing more problems than cures and we need to address that. We need to address it with other pharmacologic non-opioids or non-pharmacologic things such as a lot of things that were discussed in the last in the last discussion. So multimodal analgesia is what we're going to talk about today, the actual pharmacologic treatment of, of pain without using opioids. Multimodal, this is a busy slide, but the reality is it's simple. You pick two things. It's got to be multi. You can't just you can't just treat patients with one thing. And certainly that one thing can't be morphine. 
you might want to look at this as treating patient's pain in the different areas in which the pain is, is interacted with, with different pharmacologic agents. Uh, you know, we know that, that pain that from surgery can certainly be treated with local treatments, elevation, heat, ice, um, physical therapy, local anesthetics, blocks, that kind of thing. Uh, we also know that for surgery, some things like epidurals and spinal blocks can be helpful. And then there are medications that work peripherally, like non-steroidals, like Advil, uh, and that work centrally, like uh, acetaminophen. So there are a lot of different drugs out there that work in different parts of the body that you could pick to decide how you're going to treat pain. So now, in that pyramid, we're going to start treating pain with things that don't have opioids. So we're going to use IV acetaminophen, oral acetaminophen, NSAIDs like, like ibuprofen, COX-2 inhibitors, local, local and regional anesthetic. And if we start there, like my anesthesiologists have agreed to start there, you'll find that you really don't have to go to low-dose opioids for step two or certainly high-dose opioids. It just doesn't happen. You also have to communicate. Caregivers need to communicate with their patients. We need to set expectations. So I've ha I have lots of patients that come in and say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to operate on their child, big operation, small operation, and they go, well, it's not going to hurt, right? I'm like, well, you know, if I, if, I could, if I could really do that, I wouldn't be standing around giving talks anywhere. I'd be on, on an island somewhere writing books and teaching people how to do that, right? So, so you have to have an expectation that's set. And we as caregivers can't expect that our patients know that there's going to be pain. We need to talk about those things. And that goes a long way, and you'll see how far it goes when you're talking to the, to the patients after the experience, and they're like, oh, yeah, we did. We did talk about this. So acute pain affects every. I don't think there's anyone in this room that has, is going to say, I don't wake up in the morning and have discomfort. And we all have our ways to address that. And whether it's from acute injuries, such as surgery, or chronic conditions, it's, it's a very important part of our life that we, we have to come around to address. So this slide, if you look at the, uh, the bottom, across the bottom here, and it's basically a survey asking patients who had an acute surgical procedure and asked if they had any pain, slight pain, moderate, or severe pain. And what you'll now look up at the different boxes, and you'll notice there's really no difference, statistical difference, in the answers in this group. Now let's look where the boxes come from. This one was a study from 1995. This one was a study from 2014. So what this tells us is that from 95 to 14, despite many advances in the treatment abilities that we have, we haven't done any better at treating pain. Patients are experiencing the same pain despite all the new medications, all the new techniques, and all the things that we've learned about pain. So this speaks very loudly to us by saying we can do a better job. And the great news is all the tools to do the better job are already out there. Despite those tools, 72% of hospitals are treating patients' pain with opioid monotherapy. This was noticed by the, the U.S. Senate. I didn't realize that the U.S. Senate had a committee on narcotic abuse, but they do. And just about two years ago, they wrote a letter to CMS. It's the, that's the central medical group that sort of tells us what we can and can't do, and said, if anybody's doing this, if anybody's doing opioid monotherapy, they need to answer for it. And it goes back to that fifth, this is sort of the opposite of the fifth vital sign from the same organization saying that we need to pay attention to how we're treating pain. And if we're not using multimodal therapy, then we're not treating pain correctly. So that's a nice step in the right direction. Opioids, I, don't, I, I think I don't really have to convince anyone other than hospital administrators who have to pay more money for the medications that aren't opioids, but I don't have to convince anyone else that opioids have a lot of negative effects. Uh, opioids at the far end have, have ruined a number of lives. Um, there, I think I had a slide earlier that, that had the number of deaths that we've experienced in, in the last decade looking at, at opioids as the only reason. 
Um, it also causes much more simple things, such as constipation, which increases hospital costs, decreases our quality of life. But so that's sort of the two edges or two, two sides of the story there. But it's definitely something that, that taking it off the table and out of our bodies will improve our lives. It's going to improve the bottom line for the hospitals, which is, again, one of the arguments that we give to the hospital administrators, is that if you have patients, if, if you look at patient match controls for age and procedure and just look through their charts, if the word constipation shows up in the chart and not in the match chart, the, the patient that has the constipation in the chart will spend an average of two days longer in the hospital for the same thing, so two days. So if we can avoid that just by avoiding or diminishing opioid use in that acute situation, imagine what we can do in the chronic situations. So there's been many benefits that have been shown for multimodal therapy, and the, the top benefit is the reduction of opioid use, and that's really the one that, that we're going to focus on the most. So how do we do it? These are some of the, the medications that we use. We use acetaminophen. Now, acetaminophen's been around for about 40 years. We've only had it available as an IV medication for about five years. Europe's had it for all 40. So maybe that's another reason why they live longer and they're happier. But uh, it could be just the acetaminophen. But, but IV acetaminophen is an amazing medication for the reduction of pain. We can't use that at home, but when we have our interactions at the hospital or in the emergency rooms, it treats pain with the equivalency of pain reduction to morphine with none of those side effects. In fact, with, unless you have an allergy to acetaminophen or active liver disease, there's really no contraindication to taking it. And if we look over to the alpha-2 agonists, so DEX is a, is a fairly new medication for, uh, on this list. It's still been around for about 15 years. Uh, we find that it addresses a lot of the issues that we have with that emergence phenomena after an acute injury or surgery. The uh, neurotin you're probably, whoop, neurotin we're probably uh, familiar with. Let's see, I think I need to do that again. And, uh, and Lyrica, which I'd never really thought of Lyrica, that's uh, pregabalin, the Lyrica for acute pain, uh, but certainly uh, has been shown to be helpful in acute pain and is quite helpful for chronic pain. And then local anesthetics, ketamine. Ketamine kind of got a bad rap early on. I think people talked about the ketamine doses that gave nightmares. Uh, we don't really use the dosing of, of that. And just as ketamine was recovering from that, word got out that it was Special K and it was used as a street drug. And it's a, it's a popular street drug. But it's really a, an amazing medication for treating acute pain and has very low side effects and, and, and can help us reduce opioid use. And then non-steroidals. COX-2 inhibitors, ibuprofen, and Ketorolac, um, both IV and oral, are, are available for these medications. And I probably get a call every four to five months from a different drug company, small companies that are trying to come up with a new twist on how to make drugs that are currently available used for pain control. Like there's, uh, there's another one like, like Celebex the, uh, called uh, Meloxicam. It's been around forever. Uh, but now they're looking at ways to use meloxicam topically. There's about three companies out there that are racing to see who gets to the FDA first to get, get, an, get a uh, approval for using it in different delivery products. So they're still working on things. Uh, unfortunately, some of these medicate, well, all of these medications cost more than morphine because morphine is nearly free. I mean, it is so cheap to get morphine. The acetaminophen, the IV acetaminophen, is about $30 a dose. Uh, the IV ibuprofen is about $15 a dose. Okay, not really big numbers. But when you try to change a system that has spent zero on those things last year, and now they're going to spend $100,000 in their hospital this year, that's an uphill battle. But these are things that happen if patients and families talk to their caregivers and say, hey, we don't really want to go this opioid route. I know there's other stuff. Familiarize yourself with a couple of names. You'll get the attention. All those medications are, are down in pharmacy. They're usually, we have a thing called the Pixis, which is where the nurses can get the medications immediately, right there on, you know, either in the OR, in the ER, or on the floor. But 
There's all, the Pixis holds about 25 different medications. There are thousands of medications in the pharmacy, and these are all there. They're often not in the Pixis. So educating yourself about opportunities to avoid opioids with actual drug names can, can actually go a long way. So this is how it looks for, for an operative situation. Preoperatively, you, you kind of look, look back at that and look at this sort of like the, uh, if you go out to food and you want to pick things off the menu, you get one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. Well, you're going to pick drug A at, at the beginning of the operation. By the end of the operation, you're going to get drug B. Then, you know, you choose this by patient characteristics. There's some patients that come in and they have a history of ulcer disease. We're not going to give them a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory because there are issues with that, that that could exacerbate their problem, right? But there are others. So now we're going to go to column C and pick a medication. And then after surgery, we're going to give those two medications in a scheduled fashion. We're not going to wait till you hit, have to hit the call button. We're going to make sure you get the medication, the IV acetaminophen or the IV ibuprofen, every six hours, so you get one or the other every three hours. So every three hours, you're getting something significant to treat your pain. If you ever fall back and need something else, the narcotics are still there, although with the newest data, I would, I would encourage complete avoidance of the narcotics, if at all possible. And it really is possible because you can, go, you can use A and C and then get something from column D. There are no interactions between the groups of drugs that I put up there. There are no cross-reactivities. There's no, no commonalities of symptoms that taking one will add to the other. I mean, if you look at the, the common side effects of any drug, they all have the same ones, right? Nausea, vomiting, dizziness, constipation, diarrhea, you know, it's, it's all the same stuff, but they, they're not additive issues. But you can add these, and then when you are discharged to home, most of these medications are available in oral use. And if you haven't used narcotics while you're in the hospital, you're probably not going to use them at home. So the expected results is they're not going to use opioids in the OR, they're not going to use them post-op, you're not going to use them at home, and they're going to be fewer opioids on the street. Because if we're not writing the prescriptions, the drugs aren't getting there because the companies aren't producing the medications, and so they can't fall into the wrong hands, and the teenagers can't go to our medicine cabinet and grab a few, take a few, sell a few. We're just, we're just limiting the supply. So is there anything else out there? We've talked about a lot of kind of things that, probably medications that you, some you have heard of, some you haven't, but there's actually something not new, but new on our horizon, and that would be medical cannabis. Now, medical cannabis is a very, very hot topic. Um, the, uh, I think uh, we're all familiar with LinkedIn. I think I, I joined LinkedIn before I had anything to put on for my jobs or contracts all those years ago. Well, I was uh, appointed to a uh, board of directors of the American Medical Marijuana Physicians Association just a few months ago and my LinkedIn hits went up by 400% in 30 minutes. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm absolutely not kidding. So, so apparently people are interested. And I'm not talking about recreational marijuana. I mean, I, I personally, I mean, I'll tell you, I've never used marijuana. I'm not gonna say that for everyone in my family because I don't think I can speak for all my kids in, in that perspective. But, but my, I'm, I'm talking about medical marijuana and, and the only reason that I would soapbox about Focusing on that is like any other medication. If it is medically available and managed by caregivers, I think our end results are going to be better. And we know so little about this. You know, it's, marijuana is not a drug. Marijuana is hundreds of drugs. And until we figure out what works well for what, I think the recreational side is going to keep people from going to their caregiver and say, well, I can just buy some weed as opposed to go to that fancy dispensary and, and, and have a legitimate business transaction, right? So, so that's, that's where I've, I've sort of see the medical. So we'll talk a little bit about this. So we're talking about cannabis. There are two basic forms of cannabis. Uh, the most, the, the cannabinoids that are in these two basic forms that we hear about are THC and CBD. THC, we sort of generally feel like that's the psychotropic portion. That's the part that makes people high. Uh, that's the part that makes people relax and makes them hungry. The
The CBD, we feel, has more medicinal properties, but it's not that simple. For some conditions, the combination of the two in particular ratios seem to be the right answer. We, we don't know yet, but what we do know is we can breed these different plants to contain different amounts of THT and CBD. There's also a thing called industrial hemp. Hemp, which is actually the same plant, doesn't contain the THC. Hemp's been legal throughout the country. You can, you can take the oils from hemp, the CBD oil. That's the stuff that you can see and get on the market, get on the internet, and they can actually ship that across state lines. It's not, it's not an illegal drug. The problem is it's CBD, CBD, wherever it comes from. The problem is when you get that, when it comes to you by FedEx, you really don't know what's in the bottle. It's kind of that gray market of you really don't know what you're getting. And there are companies out there that are producing very high grade, pure CBD from industrial hemp that is medicinal quality, but I don't know exactly who they are and what you should be paying for it. So when people go, go to the local shops, the vape shops that also are selling this, you have to be wary, okay? Which is another reason why I think the, the medical marijuana angle is, is the right way to go. In Florida, the medicine is dosed in milligrams of THC and CBD. Those are things that are actually measured. So there's a lot of misnomers about cannabis. I know even when I put up that, that uh, slide, I think our, our younger people in the audience, their eyes kind of lit up. And uh, more senior people in the audience probably kind of sat back in their chair and didn't know that's what we were going to hear about. Uh, so one of the misnomers is there's no modern medical historical con or historical context of its use that it's just another fad, it's a cure-all, or there's been no research. And a, a big one is, is, is that it's a gateway drug and that we don't need another medicine for pain. We've got enough medicines. So these are all the misnomers. So I'm gonna kind of address them, but these are all things that I think are pretty easy to show aren't true. This is William Osler. Uh, he was one of the founding fathers of Johns Hopkins Hospital, wrote a book called The Principles and Practice of Medicine in 1892. And he pointed out that cannabis was a remedy for several things. Um, but they, this was specifically a statement on migraines. So the Physician's Manual of Pharmacopoeia, published in 1911, this is the national formulary for the American Medical Association. And basically what they said was that, that cannabis was again a useful medication. Now I will, full disclosure, you know, this is still published today in the AMA. Cannabis isn't in the current publication. It came out in the 40s. The, the endocannabinoid system has been researched. It was only discovered in 2005. So we're all familiar with endorphins, right? So we've got that endorphin system. Well, the endorphin system is essentially where the opioids work, okay? There is a parallel system that looks a lot like the endorphin system in its, its distribution. Lots of endorphin stuff in the brain, lots in the skeletal muscle. Same thing with the endocannabinoid system. And just like the word sounds, the receptors are affected by cannabinoids. So we, we kind of think that THC is more the, C, the cannabinoid receptor one, and the CBD goes to the cannabinoid receptor two, but they're more receptors. And it's only been around for study for about 10 years. So there's a lot going on right now, trying to figure out what things are affected, what other receptors there are. And, and that's really where the answers to the questions about what kind of marijuana and what kind of CBD to THC protocols should be used will be answered. Okay. Now, this endocannabinoid system is found in all animals. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's actually helpful because we can study it in a, in a number of different animals other than just humans. And, you know, hopefully we'll get some information relatively quickly. You know, the other piece is that the FDA is never going to allow us to use this stuff. Well, Epidolex is a, is a pure CBD oil that has been tested uh, for children who have particular issues with seizures. The uh, lennox gastaut syndromes and the Dravet syndromes, these are children that can have upwards of 50 to 150 seizures a day. And so this drug was tested and was fast-tracked through the FDA. It was approved just last month. Uh, and so we now have our first cannabinoid that's approved by the FDA for use, specifically for use in these children. Uh, and the results were, were quite amazing. They're not, it's not ubiquitous, it doesn't cure everybody, 
But if you take a child who's having 100 seizures a day and you get them down to 50, it's a big deal. If you can decrease some of the anti-seizure meds they're on, it's a big deal. And so it's kind of, kind of interesting. And, and for me, you know, I do see these patients. Uh, the neurosurgeons in this room see these patients, and they know what, what a devastating disease it is. But in addition to that, we now see a system in the FDA that's actually, we can now point at a medication that they have already approved because one of the issues we need to think about is safety. So cannabis is medicine. It's been studied quite well outside of the US. A lot of the studies are from Europe and from Israel. Um, they've, well, there's one Israeli study here uh, that was in, published in the Clinical Journal of Pain looking at the effect uh, on chronic pain. They had about 274 participants. And what they showed was they reduced their opioid consumption by 44%. Now, I will tell you that I've been to a lot of conferences. I've you know, heard a lot of papers, and any time somebody's quoting papers from outside the United States, eyebrows are raised. Well, it's a very simple reason. We're not allowed to study this in the United States. This drug was, in the 70s, was placed as a Schedule I drug right next to LSD, PCP, as having no medical usefulness, being highly addictive, and, and by the way, when it was placed there, the, the head of the DEA said, the Attorney General can take it off this list anytime he wants, he or she wants. Um, we just don't know enough about it, so we're just going to put it there. Well, Mr. Sessions isn't taking it off the list, so it's still on that list. Therefore, if you are at a university and you decide that you would like to study this, and you're also getting other federal funding, which is millions and millions of dollars that, you, that most universities get from feds, all of that funding gets pulled because you're now using something that is federally illegal. Um, and additionally, it's grown, the, the medication that could be used for research that is controlled by the US government is grown at the University of Mississippi, has been for 35 years. So a colleague actually got, you know, we have our DEA cards. She actually got a class one DEA card so she could do a study. She received a package by FedEx of this, of five kilos of this product, had it tested. The two different samples had completely different THC and CBD components. They also had fungus, pesticides, and other molds in it. So she's like, I can't, I can't give this to my patients. So um, I actually spoke uh, a new experience for me. I was at a congressional hearing and testified uh, for a bill that should go to the floor next month on allowing research to be done and assigning new places where they can grow actual medical grade marijuana that can be tested. So this is something that needs, needs to be done so we can study it here in the US. So the, the, a medication needs to be effective, safe, and legal. So we're, we're still learning about how effective it is, but for safety, no one has ever, ever died from an overdose of cannabis. There have been overdoses where people had cannabis, but they had other medications on board too. You, calling it a gateway drug has been debunked. And again, I'm up here as someone who's never tried it, but, but probably speaking like someone who uses it on a, a daily basis, because I think it has a lot of answers to the questions that we have about pain control. But no one has ever died of it. It's not a gateway drug. And we're using, the, the only FDA-approved usage today is, is for kids. So I think we're, we're making it a long way. Today, there are 30 states that have legal medical marijuana. The last state just flipped uh, last month. That was Oklahoma. So that's my now OK and OK. But, uh, and then you'll see there are about nine areas where it's actually legal in, as a recreational drug, including Washington, DC, which was kind of interesting to me. But uh, so the numbers are definitely increasing. And, and the idea that we should be able to get funding for research and diminish some of the restrictions that the, the feds have put. There's all sorts of financial issues. I mean, you probably talked about when Colorado went recreational, like you know, the bank, they said that you couldn't put money in the bank because the money could be seized. You can put money in the bank. But the, the feds have a hands-off verbal policy. They don't have a written policy. So it's definitely something 
that needs to be evaluated now that more than half the states in the U.S. have actually gone this route. By the way, I think only one of the states got this route by a legislative action without an amendment. So that, that speaks volumes that it's actually the people that are making this choice as opposed to the legislators. Here in Florida, uh, it's a lot of Florida folks here, uh, this, is, this is very important, but additionally, uh, the states that have followed Florida have actually used a lot of our rules and regs, so you'll see this in other states as well. The approved diagnosis you can use cannabis for is for cancer, epilepsy, glaucoma, MS, HIV, uh, Parkinson's, ALS, Crohn's disease, and very important, medical conditions of the same kind or class as comparable to those above. So if our patients or ourselves are not on this list, for a good example is Crohn's disease, but where's ulcerative colitis? I mean, it's kind of, you know, very, very close together. Ulcerative colitis is considered to be on the list. And then finally, chronic non-malignant pain. So there is a process involved, but this is, this is the general list that we work from. In Florida, it can only be recommended, it's not prescribed, it's recommended, can be recommended by an MD or a DO who is certified, and there's a certification process. It's not, not difficult. I am not certified and actually will not become certified. I am a, a medical director, so it would be a conflict of interest for me to actually promote the, the medication, but I'm, I'm interested in the education and research side. So if you, if you go see a certified physician, and he says, yeah, you actually qualify for medical marijuana, you then get a letter from that person and your primary care physician that's sent to the state. You then apply for a card. The card is given to you, and now you have a card that allows you to go to one of the dispensaries and say, here's my card. I'd like to get some medical marijuana. Well, that's where the problems begin because as a certified MD or DO, they can't prescribe and tell you what to go get. So then you walk into these dispensaries, which are nice, high-end, they're, they're really put together quite well and highly regulated, and you say, you know, I have chronic pain from, and so someone that, you know, we call a bud tender says, oh, you ought to try this, or, or maybe this. So you're not really getting good advice. You know, maybe you're getting great advice. You know, maybe you're getting better advice than any, any physician can give you, but maybe not. So that's a piece that we really have to work on. And that's what that society I mentioned earlier is focusing on, is trying to figure out how we can make sure that when you go to the dispensary, you're supposed to come back to your certified doc, tell them what you got, tell them what your experiences have been, so they can figure out exactly what you use. There are five companies that have been approved in the state of Florida to do this. And interestingly, those five companies had to come forward. They have to grow it, process it, and sell it. So it's vertical integration. So Big Pharma hates us. I mean, that's not how they're made, right? But the, these five companies are really working hard to be the best. The problem is, if you go to one dispensary and then you go to another, you can't say, oh, I was getting this over at this one. Can you get, they don't have like products. I mean, they, by name or by classification. So these are things that we really need to work on. And I know that we're going to have a board later so we can answer some questions, but I hope I at least piqued your interest.